Hello my friends and welcome to our teaching at Chichester Baptist Church today. My name is Ian White and I'm one of the members at the church and we're doing a series of talks on the Gospel's DNA. So let's start by diving into some of the smallest objects known to man, individual molecules. This is a cartoon representation of deoxyribonucleic acid or DNA for short. It's a self-replicating material which is present in nearly all living organisms and it carries our genetic information. Now, we've come to think of DNA as the thing that makes each of us unique. There is not another Ian White anywhere else on the planet and for that you should be eternally grateful. You are unique too. So what is the DNA of the Gospel? What makes our Christian message unique? Well, in the Bible passage you've just heard read to us so beautifully, we get some clues. You might like to have a Bible handy and turn to Acts chapter 4. The book of Acts was written by Luke, the same person as composed Luke's Gospel. And let's give a bit of backstory to this event. Jesus has been very publicly executed by the Romans, thanks to a dastardly piece of manipulation by his Jewish opponents. But a few days after, he was repeatedly being seen alive and news of this had set Jerusalem buzzing. Some believed it, some were agnostic, and others were vehemently opposed to it, even if it turned out to be the truth. Peter and John were two of Jesus' disciples who went up to the massive Jerusalem temple one day for worship, as they often did. On their way in, they met a man begging who had been crippled from birth. He was now probably in his 40s. And they said to the man, In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get up and walk. And he did. Now, this caused a huge rumpus, with about 5,000 men gathering to hear Peter and John teach about it. Now, actually, of course, the, the total number would be much more than that, because traditionally women weren't included in the count. So this comes close to overrunning the temple complex. The authorities were furious. And partly because Peter and John were teaching that Jesus had been raised from the dead, which they disagreed with anyway, uh, but also because they, the powers that be, were, were being upstaged by a couple of commoners. Peter and John were arrested and interrogated. Uh, and it's that interrogation that tells us so much about how unique the Christian message is. So let's dive into it, shall we? Have a look at verse 7 of chapter 4. <clears throat> they had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them about the healing. By what power or name did you do this? Now, the identity of the person or the power that brought about this healing was crucially important to them, and with good reason. The, the Jews' theology told them that healings especially instantaneous or miraculous healings, were God's territory. They had a well-established set of criteria which helped them to understand which healings were miraculous and which were less so. Well, Peter and John made no secret about this and no secret about the source of it all. Rulers and elders of the people, they said, know this. It is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. So Peter and John were just telling it like it was. Now, it was well known that the Jewish authorities, some of these very men, had had Jesus, the healer and teacher, killed out of envy. Jesus exposed their hypocrisy and they wanted rid of him. And having had him killed, they thought they'd stamped out this wild Jesus is the Messiah ideology. But now it was kicking off all over again. 
and Peter and John took it one step further. Salvation, or wholeness, is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved or made whole. You can't do it. The magicians can't do it. The doctors can't do it. Only Jesus can. Now the Jews' theology told them that miraculous healings like this could only be done by God himself. And this had been done in the name of Jesus. So who does that make Jesus? Now, uh, this has a, a contemporary take to it. It is sometimes said, and, and I've heard it said to me, aren't you Christians being arrogant by saying that Jesus is the only way of reaching God? Now, before we think about the particular claim of Jesus' uniqueness, let's pause and think about arrogance for a moment. It seems to me that arrogance can have more to do with the way I say something than it does the thing I'm saying. I could say to you, for example, that 5 plus 7 equals 12. Uh, that would be a simple piece of arithmetic. We've known it since we were kids. I don't feel a need to be assertive, let alone arrogant in saying that. It's just a sober statement of reality. We've all done the arithmetic. We all did it when we were very young. Take five things, add seven to them, and you end up with 12. Simples. Here's another example. I could say that every member of a permutation group can be expressed as a product of transpositions. Now, that's a different sort of statement, and you would need a little bit of mathematics to understand it. But it's just as reliable and just as incontrovertible as 5 plus 7 equals 12. We have no need to feel assertive, let alone arrogant, in saying it. It's incontrovertible. It's provable. It's just the way life is, although you would need a bit of background to grasp it. Let me introduce you, if you don't know him already, to Ben Uren. Some of you will know Ben well, he's part of our church. Now, Ben has a superpower. Just watch this. Professor Rubik originally created his cube in order to demonstrate the theorem that I quoted just a moment ago. Without it, Rubik's cube would be completely insoluble, totally impossible. But Ben has just given us evidence of the truth of the theorem. Now, none of us need to be assertive or arrogant about it, because the evidence is just there. Ben's given it to us. Now, you may be thinking right now, Ian, where is all this going? Well, let me explain. This is where Peter and John were in Acts chapter 4. Let, let's do our best to be a fly on the wall. Uh, Peter and John didn't need to be assertive or arrogant about Jesus being the only person who could heal like this because the evidence was just there. The sight of this once crippled man standing upright in front of the Sanhedrin left the Jewish authorities without a leg to stand on. Peter and John were simply telling it like it is. You see, in our faith, evidence matters. Throughout history, evidence, especially evidence of who Jesus is, has been a key part of the DNA of the Gospel. As a, a former research scientist myself, I am satisfied that my faith does not rest on myths and legends. It rests on verifiable facts and events, which leave me confident about its truth. That's part of the Gospel's DNA. Now, let's return to DNA for a moment. 
The original interpretation of this molecule was made by two scientists, the American biologist James Watson and the English physicist Francis Crick in the 1950s. Subsequently, the race has been on to dig into the details and map the human genome from beginning to end. Now, James Watson's successor was this man, Francis Collins. He started life with a love of mathematics and then went into medicine. And he talks about being rather pleased that he didn't have any religion in his upbringing. Until, that is, a patient asked him what he believed himself. And here's his story. And one afternoon, one of my patients, a wonderful elderly woman, much like a grandmother, uh, who had very bad heart disease. Uh, she had a particularly bad episode of chest pain uh, while I was with her. And she got through it, and at the end of that, explained to me how her faith was the thing that helped her in that situation. She realized that the doctors around her weren't really giving her that much help, but her faith was. And after she finished her own very personal description uh, of that face, she turned to me, and I had been silent, and she looked at me quizzically, and she said, what do you believe, doctor? And ultimately, I had to admit to myself that her question had made me realize that I had arrived at an answer to the most important issue that we humans ever deal with. Is there a God? And I had arrived there without ever really looking at the evidence. And I was supposed to be a scientist. If there's one thing scientists claim they do is to arrive at conclusions based upon evidence. And I hadn't taken the trouble to do that. I was greatly assisted uh, by a pastor who lived down the road who I went and asked about all this and who gave me a copy of C.S. Lewis's wonderful book, Mere Christianity. Because here was an Oxford scholar, a prodigiously developed intellect, who had traveled the same path. Within those pages, I realized for the first time that one can come to belief on a rational basis and that in fact, given the many pointers that one sees around oneself in terms of the universe and it having a beginning and its fine-tuning in terms of the way in which all those constants that determine the behavior of matter and energy seem to have been set just in a certain very precise range to make life possible. Uh, and many other things, including my beloved mathematics and why they actually work anyway to describe the universe, something that makes you think the Creator must have been a mathematician. That brought me then to the person of Jesus Christ as a person who was historically extremely well documented. That was news to me. I thought Christ was as much myth as history, and I realized after reading more about it, this was a historical figure upon which we have a great deal of evidence for his existence and his teachings, and even his rising from the dead in a literal way. That day at uh, my patient's bedside started a journey for me. A journey that I was reluctant uh, to begin, but I felt I needed to. A journey that I thought would result in strengthening my atheism, but to my surprise, resulted in my conversion. He started by expecting to disprove the truth of the gospel, but ended up realising the evidence was compelling. And he is far from the only one. Lee Strobel was a journalist with the Chicago Tribune and Daily Herald. Something happened in his life that got him using his investigative skills to interrogate the evidence for the Gospel. I've spent my entire career as a journalist uncovering the truth. Until the day my wife presented me with the biggest story of my life. I'm not going to lose my wife and my kids to something that I can't even reason with. And what happened next changed me forever. How can we even talk about historical evidence for the resurrection? The Gospels are filled with contradictions. The empty tomb is based on evidence. And isn't evidence your trade? We all bet our lives on something. The question is, what's it going to be? As much as I would... It's an amazing story about one man who started as a skeptic and ended up realising that the evidence pointed to the truth of what the Gospel says. Now, you may say, well, you know, that's all very well for a prize-winning journalist or a university professor, but what about me? Well, let's come back to Acts chapter 4, because 
it is the identity of Peter and John that made a difference here. When the Jewish leaders saw the courage of Peter and John and realised that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished. You know, I, <laughs> I love the original Greek text of this verse. It says that Peter and John were agrammatoi and idiotai. They were ungrammared idiots. Now, in truth, agrammatoi means that they were not schooled to a high level. They weren't university professors. And idiotai is the general word used in common Greek of ordinary people. This is the common man. This is Mr. Average. Hey, that's us. God chose ordinary people to carry his extraordinary message. You know, if the message of the gospel needed a prodigious intellect in order to grasp it, then only the university professors would be Christians. But the message is so simple that by coming to Christ and seeking his forgiveness and copying him, modelling our lives on him, God transforms us from the inside out. And that's what made these two ordinary men stand out as completely different. Verse 13, the Jewish leaders took note that these men had been with Jesus. It seemed that that was the only difference they could put their finger on. And that too is part of the gospel's DNA. Spending time with Jesus, copying him, modelling our lives on him. That transforms us from ordinary people into ordinary people who know that we're loved by God, have a purpose in life, and are thus made whole. Now, I don't know where you stand on any of this today, but I would like to lead you in two prayers. The first prayer is for those of us who attach the word Christian to ourselves and want our faith to be more solid. The second is for any of us who've been thinking about these big questions of life but haven't quite settled on a relationship with God yet. So you might like to bow your head or shut your eyes or do whatever says to you, God, I'm communicating with you right now. First of all, then, Heavenly Father, I thank you so much that I'm confident about you. You've made me the person I am. I'm rescued and whole and I enjoy a relationship with you. But there are times when communicating this feels a bit beyond me. I don't feel capable of talking about it or living it in any more than a very private way. Please help me to live for you in such a way that my friends and my family and my colleagues begin to notice the difference. I want to be like Peter and John. Although they were ordinary people, they were channels of your extraordinary love and your power into one man. Please help me to be like this so people can see the result of me spending time with you in the way I speak, the way I live and the way I talk. Amen. And now if you don't feel you're a Christian just yet but you want to get closer to God then pray this with me. Dear God, I thank you for the example of Peter and John, two ordinary people who made a difference because they spent time with Jesus. Thank you for putting evidence in my path and I want to take that evidence seriously. Forgive me for anything that gets in the way and help me to begin modelling my life on your son Jesus. I come to you just as I am and I ask you to do your work in me. Thank you that you want to do that too. Amen.
If you prayed either of those prayers, I would love to know. You can email or phone the church and I'd be very happy to talk with you about where to go next. God bless you. Well, from here you can like, you can subscribe and you can click elsewhere to see some more videos from this channel that I hope will feed your faith.